Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Jan Ostrovsky, and he will tell us about the relativistic structure formation beyond the standard perturbation theory. Please. Hey, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, shall we close the doors, maybe? So yes, uh, as my title says, uh, I want to talk about the relativistic structure formation, and I want to point out uh, or present uh, two methods which are beyond the standard relativistic perturbation theory, which we use in cosmology, and give a two simple applications of, the, of these methods. So I'll start by just sketching uh, what methods do we use in cosmology to generate the rich web of structures that we see uh, in our cosmological observations. So we have um, many objects on many different scales, starting from uh, galaxies where the interest of cosmologists start. The group of galaxies, the galaxy clusters, superclusters, and the complicated uh, structure of filaments, sheets, and voids. So the most popular approach is to take the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker background, which is a homogeneous isotropic metric, and then perturb the, this metric uh, and perturb the associated stress energy tensor, linearize, linearize the Einstein equations, and this will give us the uh, evolution of the initial conditions. The problem with this is that obviously, since this is a perturbation theory, perturbations have a limited domain of applications. Namely, uh, for instance, the density contrast has to be small. And as we know, the virialized objects on the large scales uh, these days have a density contrast of around 200. So this is way uh, above the requirements of the perturbation theory. However, this can be circumvented by a smart choice of gauge, but there is a much deeper and serious problem with the perturbation theory. And that is, we assume that on the largest scales, our universe is described well by the Friedman equations. So the Friedmanian metric and the average density. I will get to that in a, in a second. I just want to mention here that the, no, sorry, that the other methods involve exacting homogeneous solutions. So we don't want to uh, stick to the perturbative regime. We want to have an exact solution which accounts for the fact that the structures are formed. The problem with that is that these are notoriously difficult to solve. And usually we require a high degree of symmetries in order to integrate uh, these equations. So they very often are not very realistic. Uh, a very promising direction of research is uh, the numerical cosmology. In the recent years, there have been several codes uh, which are close to relativistic. So this is a work in progress, but we have a high hopes regarding these uh, attempts. There are, however, less known, but also very conservative in a sense, uh, approaches. One is the observational one. So this is the most basic question. Given that we observe certain uh, features of the universe from a very specific point in the universe, without making any additional assumptions, how much information can we extract in a model independent way? And the last but not least is the averaging problem, which I will uh, give you a sketch of on the next slides. So as I said, the perturbation theory is uh, haunted by a very serious problem, meaning that we do assume that the Friedmanian metric matched to the average density via the Einstein equation is the good approximation to the universe at largest scales. But in fact, uh, what we want to do is take a lumpy universe as we see it, which has a rich structures on different scales and have a mathematically rigorous way to smooth or average out 
uh, and to smooth and average out not only the uh, stress energy tensor, but also the geometry. And in other words, we want to build the background and it's, and it's nowhere said that this in fact will fulfill the Friedman equations. So uh, this was rather nicely put into these uh, three problems with uh, cosmology by Alice Larena, Uma and Clarkson. So these are divided into three inter interrelated problems. First one is exactly this averaging. So general relativity, which we assume is a correct theory to describe the universe, is notoriously difficult in a sense that it's a nonlinear and tensorial theory. So average of a tensor is not a mathematically well-defined concept because in general, we lose the information. So to compare tensors, we have to bring them to uh, the same point, And this is not a unique procedure wherever we try to integrate it. On top of that, it's a nonlinear theory. And as I will explain on the next slide, this also causes a problem. Even if we find an averaging method, then we'll still have to deal with the nonlinearities of the theory. So this is uh, basically coined as a averaging problem, which leads to the back reaction. So as we go from the left to the right, we cumulatively uh, smooth out not only the stress energy tensor, but also the gravitational degrees of freedom. To do it consistently, it's very hard. And basically there is no overall agreed method to do that. The third also related problem is that we are not an average observer in the universe. We are actually in the galaxy, which is a part of the local group. So the question is, we are trying to fit the Friedmanian metric to the observed universe. And what is the method to do that is still unclear. So as I mentioned before, the averaging problem is rooted in the fact that the general relativity is a nonlinear theory. So here I sketched uh, a simple scheme, which I will explain now. So let us assume that we do know how to meaningfully average tensors. So these angle brackets will uh, represent some form of smoothing or averaging. So what we know is, uh, let's say on the scales of a solar system, we know the metric, and we know the Einstein equations, and these are exact. As we move up in the scales, for instance, to a galaxy scale, we apply this averaging uh, operator to the metric, and then we see that the Einstein tensor built from the averaged metric is not equal to the averaged Einstein tensor. And this is because the theory is nonlinear, so whenever you have an integrals, and there are quadratic terms. The integral of the x squared is not equal to the integral of x times integral of x, to put it simply. This is a cumulative process. So when we arrive at the homogeneity scale, we can see that the Einstein tensor built out of the Friedmanian metric is equal to the average stress energy tensor plus an additional term, which is usually referred to as a back reaction, which comes from the fact that we're all the nonlinearities are being smoothed out on the consecutive scales. The magnitude of this is still a subject of the debate. And there is no simple answer to that, to put it, uh, in, other, to put it in other words. So one way to get around this is to model a local universe and try to build the background in a bottom-up approach instead of a top-down approach. And I will present, as I said, two methods. One is called the silent universe, which is becoming slightly outdated, but it's still a powerful technique. The other is the relativistic Zilovich approximation. I will try to give you a, an idea of what these methods are like and show you a simple applications. So the silent universe is based on the technique of uh, the composition of the Einstein equations, which is called the one plus three which uh, resembles, of course, in the name, the, the usual three plus one, where we choose the hypersurface of a constant time, but the one plus three, in the one plus three formalism, we pick uh, time 
uh, time like unit vector it can be uh, for velocity and we decompose things with respect to this uh, velocity and the uh, spatial uh, orthogonal surfaces to this velocity so uh, given that sorry yes uh, in the silent universe approach uh, we will use the quantities which are called the expansion shear and rotation which are the parts of the velocity gradient as you can know this is like a schematic uh, description of this so contract so uh, expansion or contraction is just the change of the volume the rotation is the anti-symmetric change of the shape and the shear uh, which is a trace-free symmetric part just tells us how things are deformed the silent universe as i will show uh, is a simplified model of the universe with no rotation, no pressure, and no magnetic part of the wild tensor. It's a trade-off. Obviously, we're talking about the matter-dominated uh, universe, where we think that on the above a certain scale, rotation doesn't play that much role. The pressure basically becomes important when things are starting to stabilize. And the magnetic part of the wild tensor is basically responsible for the gravitational waves, which we think do not affect the larger structure formation uh, significantly. So I will just introduce a little bit of a notation because I wanted to show you how starting from a pretty general model by getting rid of certain terms, we arrive at the silent uh, approximation. Well, it's not a it's an approximation in a physical sense, meaning this is still an exact solution to Einstein equations. The approximation comes from the fact that we are neglecting certain physical terms. And this one plus three formalism allows us to intuitively know which kind of processes we exclude from our considerations. So as I said, we will be using the for velocity. Uh, we have a spatial metric, which will serve as a projection. Here's the important bit we have three types of derivatives basically so one is just the directional derivative along the velocity there is a spatial projection of the covariant derivative on the surface orthogonal to the velocity and there is something which is called a spatial rotation or a spatial curl so we will use this decomposition I mentioned before when we have a velocity gradient we can decompose it into the expansion shear and rotation uh, I kept the acceleration here as well for the generality so these are not that important uh, bits I just keep them for completeness we will also look at the projection of the vial tensor where we have the electric part which has a Newtonian interpretation this is responsible for the tidal effects and the magnetic part which is uh, usually associated with the gravitational waves so we will look and at the stress energy conservation and the Ricci identities first so these give us the uh, continuity equation and uh, momentum constraint and we get a nice evolution equations for the above mentioned expansion shear and rotation so already from here so the idea behind the silent universe is that we don't want in the evolution equations a sources containing spatial derivatives intuitively speaking once the initial constraints are fulfilled on the initial hypersurface each wall line evolves independently, meaning there are no spatial derivatives along the evolution. So in that sense, we will get rid of uh, acceleration and as a consequence of pressure. To move on, it means that there are no sound waves between the neighboring wall lines. So there is no way of communication between so first of all, that it's dust, so no pressure and no acceleration. And the fact that there are no, well, if once I collect everything, maybe I'll give them more physical, okay? We have also the evolution of the electric and the magnetic part, and we have the constraints. So as you can see, the magnetic part of the bio tensor is composed purely of the spatial derivatives 
So in fact, we will want to get rid of that as well. And since these have to be zero independently, we will have to get rid of the rotation as well. So this is not a nice uh, view to, to see, but in fact, sorry, we will get rid of all of these terms. And with that in mind, what is left, so, okay, it looks like we're getting rid of almost everything, but in fact, these are very subtle uh, relativistic terms, which play a lesser role in the structure formation, it is believed. So, yes. Is it possible to tell that somehow all the terms scale up or is it possible to have some kind of scale of energy or the spatial um, spatial thing of sigma or tensor or I show that show that the terms are controlled by some small number is it possible to talk about this way? So in a sense, in a silent universe being a zeroth order of a perturbation of these quantities. Uh, and you're thinking of a scale dependence, meaning as we, as we, as we go up. Yes, definitely with the rotation. Uh, probably first, the haven't thought about it, but I'm 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 almost sure that this could work. Yeah, probably. Yes. So, um, what does it mean physically? So, we have a model which is called dust, which means it has no pressure. It's irrotational dust. So, the wall lines are not rotating, and there is uh, no magnetic part of the biotensor. So. Physically, the world lines evolve and they do not exchange information via the sound waves because the pressure is put to zero and gravitational waves because the magnetic part of the biotensor is zero. The only way they interact in a sense is via the electric part so they can feel each other in this sense. And hence the name silent, meaning once the initial hypersurface constraints are solved, then the evolution of the each wall line is decoupled because we killed all the spatial derivatives in the sources. So, uh, yes, so there is a one nice feature which is coming out of it. Also, uh, people analyze these models. First of all, that all of these constraints propagate. So this is an exact solution of the Einstein's equation. It's not based on metric, which is nice. So actually, this class of models contains a lot of known metrics like LTB, which is spherically symmetric, the Schreckeres metric, which, is, which has just the quasi-symmetries. The fact that it doesn't refer to a specific metric is an advantage because all the, all the spatial symmetries will reveal themselves on the initial hypersurface and the evolution equation actually are the same for all of these configurations. So uh, also what is nice is that the shear and the electric part uh, share the same eigenframe. So they are both diagonalizable and then they can be described by single numbers, which I put here. So now I will move to a simple application of this model. So this is the, the, let's say, the beauty of the simplicity of this model. So we have only four ordinary differential equations for four, uh, quanti for four fields. We have a density expansion, the shear, and the electric part of the biotensor. This system is fully integrable. And as I said, a lot of exact solutions which do possess certain symmetries are included in this. So what we did with that is we wanted to see what does it tell us about the formation of the largest structures in the universe, so uh, clusters and the galaxy superclusters. And for that, we uh, constructed a statistical tool, which is called the mass function. So mass function here, it's in its differential form, tells us how many number of a virialized objects of a given mass are expected at the given redshift. And we can do that by looking at the initial conditions and then 
I have having an initial conditions, uh, for instance, a density field, we can smooth it on the consecutively bigger scales. And for each of the scale, we have we can draw a distribution of possible initial conditions, evolve it, and see how many of these domains collapse up to a given redshift. So the basic advantage of this is we will not use the Lambda CDM uh, background. So we are background free modulo that for the initial conditions, we assume that this is close to homogeneous one because we have to somehow uh, nevertheless account for the fact that the CMB is close to homogeneous, but then we evolve it without referring to any uh, to any background. So uh, this is the, let's say, an advantage of this because, well, in principle, general relativity is a background free, free theory. So this is in the spirit of general relativity. So what we will do is we will calculate the expected numbers of the objects in the given mass range in the given at the given redshift range. And this is related to the uh, differential density number of the objects. And also we will take into account the fact that the sky surveys are covering uh, not the full sky, but a certain uh, square degrees of the sky. So we have to take into account what is the expected, what is this specific cosmology survey uh supposed to see so given that we made the calculations so the upper upper two panels are calculations using the silent universe so no reference to lambda cdm we just look at the local fluctuations of density and evolve them according to the silent evolution equations the lower panels are the ones obtained from uh Newtonian based n body simulations where the background is fixed, it's evolving according to the Friedmanian law. But this is an n body simulation, which means it's not a perturbative thing. So, what we see in the upper left is we looked at the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. It identified uh, five biggest clusters. We took the average of this mass also with the, with the errors, of course. And we calculated the expected number of the objects of such a mass up to a certain redshift. So as I said, we took five. So our expectation uh, values are well within what is being observed, meaning we should expect this, this is in reality five. We expect that we should observe twice as much, but the situation will only get better in the sense the new clusters are being identified. So this is this is a statistical uh, matter. So when we look here, this is the Lambda CDM based and body simulations. There is a big problem in terms of the biggest objects. Uh, the biggest objects predicted by the Lambda CDM uh, theory. And you can think of it in the following way. In the Lambda CDM theory, there is an upper limit for the size or the mass of the objects to form because the Lambda kicks in at certain time and no, no more uh, collapse is possible. That's why it gives, uh, it gives uh, predictions which are at odds with, what, with what's being observed. On the right panels, we just plot it what is the volume needed to observe at least one of these objects? And this is exactly the Atacama Cosmology uh, Telescope uh, coverage. This is the full sky. So in our model, this is uh, perfectly within the possibilities of this uh, cosmological survey. Again, when we look at the Lambda CDM to observe at least one of such objects, the Atacama Cosmological Telescope should cover the full sky. So all I'm saying is basically once we get rid of the assumption, which is not uh, rigorously uh, justified, we do find a better agreement with observations, but there's a trade-off because when we try to construct the background out of these domains that we evolved with the silent universe, it actually doesn't match a Lambda uh, CDM background. And 
for that, maybe I will uh, recommend to read one of the uh, Christoph Balako's paper on the emergence of the spatial curvature. Uh, okay, sorry. So this concludes the part about the silent universe. I want to move to the other uh, bit now, and I'll start with talking about the averaging problem in cosmology. So here we'll take a slightly different approach. We will look at the Einstein equations, but only in the, the scalar parts. As I said, the problem with the general relativity is that it's a tensorial theory. So the averages of the tensors are not well-defined mathematical objects, but we can take the traces of the Einstein equations and look at the scalars and the averages of scalars are well-defined. So here we just have the continuity equation, uh, the Hamiltonian constraint where this is the three Ricci scalar curvature and the famous ratio Dury equation. So what we will do is we will define the averaging operator with the Riemannian volume element and uh, the volume of the domain. So the uh, subscript D just uh, denotes the fact that this is any domain, uh, but any finite domain. So in addition, we will uh, define the domain dependent scale factor and the domain dependent Hubble parameter. The idea is that once we have an initial hypersurface and uh, which is slightly inhomogeneous, if we apply an averaging at this hypersurface and evolve it in time, this does not commute with evolving the small inhomogeneities and performing averaging later. And this non-commutation of spatial averaging and time propagation is basically uh, included in this commutation formula. So as I said, just to repeat, we take the scalar parts of the Einstein equations and we uh, apply this commutation formula. And what we end up with, with is the averaged uh, acceleration equation and the average Hamiltonian constraints. So as you can see, this depends on the domain of our averaging. The interesting bit is if the universe was exactly homogeneous, this reduces to the usual Friedman equations. But since it's not, it has this additional term, which is called the back reaction. Here we have an average uh, three Ricci as well. And this back reaction is combined of a variance of the expansion and the averaged rotation and the shear rate. The problem is that since we have these two equations uh, and we neglected all the non-scalar parts of the Einstein equations, this is not closed. So we need the closure condition, some sort of effective equation of state to close the equations. So this brings me to the second uh, method used in a relativistic uh, cosmology, which uh, allows to close these equations and which is referred to usually as relativistic Zeldovich approximation. I will start just by give you a sketch of how the original Zeldovich idea worked and then uh, show you how to transfer from this Newtonian consideration to the relativistic considerations. So, uh, what we will use is the idea of the Eulerian and the Lagrangian framework. So if we are in a medium where there are no forces, basically the Eulerian position is related to the Lagrangian position by an initial velocity and time. So what Zeldovich thought is that he could model a trajectory of the fluid by using this kinematical picture, but modifying it. So here we move to the cosmological coordinates, say. So this is, again, Eulerian system is when the, we look at the fixed uh, points in space. The Lagrangian one is when we co-moving with the fluid. This is a hydro, these are hydrodynamical uh, terms. So he modified it by adding uh, the scale factor, which uh, accounts for the expansion. And also, since one, we want the structures to form, there's an ad additional time function uh, which uh, is responsible for the collapse of the matter. So this is, again, a velocity field which is related to the initial gravitational potential. 
So then he looked at the mass conservation and uh, concluded that this being a Jacobian of the transformation between the uh, R and Q, that the density should be given by some uh, averaged density and this denominator where we still don't know what is this time function. And these are, this is called a deformation tensor. So these are just the, the spatial derivatives of the initial velocity field. So here's the important bit. If this is small, we can expand it and then we will get the equation for the usual Eulerian density evolution. Since we can do that, we, by comparison, we can fix this time dependent function, but the idea of Zeldovich was to nevertheless not to, uh, not to use the density which is linearized, but use the fully nonlinear um, expression. So what does it mean? So we have a nonlinear density. This uh, matrix is diagonalizable, so we can uh, represent it as a product of these functions where these are, these are just the eigenvalues of this matrix. And this is a nonlinear density field obtained from a linearized, uh, from the linearized expression where we got this time dependent function by comparing it to the usual Eulerian one. To give you a picture. So once there is a clump of matter uh, which evolves, it has, uh, these are ordered uh, eigenvalues. So the expansion occurs quicker along one direction, which leads to the something which we call a sheet in the cosmological structure. Then uh, the second axis catches up and thus creates the filaments. And when the third axis is uh, catching up with the previous two, we get the galaxy cluster. This is like a fully nonlinear picture. And it actually was a big surprise at the time that this works because in a sense, what we're doing is we are using, using the perturbation theory, but then the solution of this perturbation theory is put into the formula without any further truncation. Because when you think about it, this is small, so all of these products should be even smaller. But we are not neglecting them, and thanks to that, we are able to enter the mildly nonlinear regime. Given that, it got the so that was the original Zeldovich idea. The point is now that this is uh, better rigorously uh, explained by looking at the Eulerian and Lagrangian perturbation theory. So this is a standard Newtonian uh, set of equations which describes a cosmological fluid. We have an Euler equation, continuity equation, and the fact that our gravitational field is uh, rotation free and the divergence is given by the density. In the usual standard Newtonian perturbation theory, we have to perturb density and velocity. So these are two independent variables. But if we use the Lagrangian perturbation theory, first of all, this is the Lagrangian picture. So instead of treating velocity and density as independent, we will look at the trajectories of the fluid as our basic variable. And every the, all of the content of these equations will be just uh, expressed via these simple two equations involving only one variable. Of course, with the different coefficients. The point being that if we perturb that, we don't have to have two independent perturbations. All we do is perturb the trajectory of the fluid. So if our fluid, if our background fluid is evolving uh, like the following the Hubble law, we do a small perturbation and then we evaluate all of the relevant uh, quantities just by inserting this perturbation into equations. As it turns out, the first order solution of this Lagrangian perturbation theory is exactly the Zeldovich approximation. And this is just to relax a little bit and I don't have much pictures, so I decided to put this one. As I said, the original Zeldovich idea was uh, based on this kinematical approach. 
meaning that we treat the trajectories of the fluid as if they were going in the straight lines. And there is a there's a nice analogy. So when we think of a surface of a swimming pool and the light rays falling on, and since it's wavy, uh, they are being uh, diffracted or refracted by uh, different angles, but then they follow the straight lines and develop caustics, so which resemble the actual structure of the universe for the very uh, same reason that I said that if we model the fluid as a straight trajectories, we get the structures that we observe today. So now without going into details, there is a relativistic version of it, and it's in the spirit of the original Lagrangian perturbation theory and the Zoldovich idea. So what we will do is we take the Einstein equations and we want to Again, not have the metric perturbations and the stress energy perturbations. We want to perturb just the one quantity. We have to express them in terms of uh, Cartan coframes. And we perturb this Cartan uh, coframe with respect to the background. And this is the problematic bit. But in the summary, I will give you the, uh, the recent update on that. So once we have this Einstein equation expressed in terms of a Cartan coframes, which are perturbed, we linearize it to solve for the perturbation. And once this uh, solution is obtained, we evaluate all the relevant quantities like curvature, density, all the vial tensors without further truncating anything. So without getting rid of higher order terms. So, this is the solution coming out of these considerations. This is an equivalent of this deformation tensor. And we have, again, as in the previous uh, example in the Newtonian case, we have this time-dependent function, which is a solution to the equation for the density evolution in the usual perturbation theory. What is Beautiful about it and very useful is that it's a simple model for the evolution of the fluid, which closes the averaged equations. So you can treat it as a certain matter model, which gives you an effective equation of state. But what is more surprising is that this is in principle a perturbative approach, but it contains as a subcase and exact solutions like the Sekeresh metric of class two, the one which can be decomposed into a background and the deviations. So by this idea of extrapolation and not getting rid of higher order terms in the functionals, we have a very general powerful tool, which under special circumstances recreates the exact solutions. So now I will present the one possible application of it, which we've done recently, and that is Estimation of the volume, a maximum volume of the collapsing structures. So this is a simple schematic. Uh, OK, I wish that could be displayed, actually, but uh, because on the next. Okay. 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 Sorry for that. So, uh, the very intuitive way we uh, visualize the collapse is it starts expanding uh, with the universe at the initial uh, time. It reaches some turnaround and then it decouples from the Hubble flow and then it collapses the structure. And this is as simple as it gets. This is, this is uh, how we visualize that. And there was an interesting observation uh, made by these gentlemen that actually for a fixed mass in the Lambda CDM universe, this turnaround radius has its maximum uh, value. Uh, which is just a function of this mass and the cosmological constant. So 
you can think of this uh, turnaround as a demarcation line between the collapsing region and the expanding region, which means that this is a surface of a zero expansion. If we think of a velocity field as a continuous field, it has to be, it has to have a zero expansion surface. If something is collapsing, yet the universe is expanding. So uh, some numerical people decided to check the n-body simulations and look for uh, these uh, zero expansion surfaces. So this is one of the simulations. Uh, they are looking at the average, uh, sorry, not the average, and the expansion equals zero points. And this is just a thin slice perpendicular to the line of sight. So, so far so good, we can just have a like a guide of eye line to approximately try to find uh, this maximum radius. But when we look at the full three-dimensional picture, we see that things get much more complicated and it's very hard to uniquely determine what is the zero expansion surface. But what is possibly easier to do is to look at what is the maximum volume, which is related to the average expansion being zero instead of point-like expansion being zero. And since we're talking about the extended objects, the averaging is inevitably uh, going to be used. And since we have the averaged equations and we have a closure condition, we decided to use all of these. So we will look at the Hamiltonian constraint with again, this averaging operator. And as you can see, uh, the averaged expansion is given by the condition that the volume is at its maximum. Uh, so we use again, this non-commutation formula for the Hamiltonian constraint and using this relativistic Zeldovich approximation as a closure condition, we come up with a very simple formula for the maximum volume. I should mention that probably that the previous uh, value, which was related to the mass and the cosmological constant was done for a spherical symmetry and was calculated based on the perturbation theory. Here, the shape of the domain is uh, irrelevant to our considerations. So we do not require any symmetries plus we are not using just the standard perturbation theory, but the relativistic Zeldovich approximation, which is uh, a non-linear in a sense that I explained before. So as you can see, the uh, now we have a simple equation which uh, just gives us the maximum volume of a given object as a function of its mass, the average density, uh, the background Hubble scale factor, and the solution to this usual uh, linear uh, equation for the density. So what is good about it is we are not in a way restricted to the Lambda CDM uh, model because we can look at different backgrounds. So in that way, our formula can serve as a test for the cosmological models or the cosmological backgrounds. So here it's just to show you the differences between the previously mentioned approach. So uh, our approach gives, of course, the values which, which are changing uh, with the redshift in terms of, so, so this is the uh, cubic root of the maximum volume that we expect a different redshift. And here for different masses, the solid lines are, 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 are our predictions, while the dashed lines are again, these fixed values calculated from the perturbation theory. As you can see, they do converge. And let me remind you also that we're talking about the averaged expansion rate, not the point like expansion rate. And that why, that's why uh, these things differ. However, our method not only is more general in a sense that it, uh, allows for an arbitrary domains, but it also allows for testing and different cosmological backgrounds, which we can do via just uh, putting the different uh, Hubble parameters. That brings me to the conclusions. So 
probably what I wanted to say mostly or stress mostly is that we are not limited to the perturbation theory, the standard perturbation theory, which uh, is rooted in a still unsolved problem of how to construct rigorously a background. We can think of the perturbation theory as a top-down approach, meaning we assume a large-scale behavior fulfills the Einstein equation good enough, and then we perturb it. We can think conservatively. We know that the general relativity works on the scales of a solar system. We can assume that it's pretty good on the galaxy scales. We can just try to build this large-scale behavior bottom-up by smartly considering uh, how to all of the junction conditions and the evolution of the local fluid. What is also a generic feature of the cosmology is we don't have an initial conditions understood as a like a metric extrinsic curvature, intrinsic curvature. We basically have a statistical description of a certain field. And this is how we should approach that. Plus, what we usually do is we look at the universe at different scales. We obtain that by smoothing it with a certain window functions. And thus, inevitably, we are averaging. So we are forgetting about the certain features of the inhomogeneous universe on different scales. What I want to point out is that this is not a usual way of just saying that there are no incomogeneities in the density. We also get rid of the gravitational degrees of freedom, and these are not trivial to take into account. Uh, so my last remark is that recently we developed a um, generalization of the relativistic Lovitch approximation, which now is not anchored to this just time-dependent background, but it's uh, the scale factor is now also space-dependent, and we did it because we want to include wanted to include the second class of the Shekhar's metric, and hence, and that's probably presented in uh, this paper, and hence we have a very general tool to model the structure formations, which as a special case includes the whole spectra of exact solutions, including the Sekharov metric being the most general exact solution for that used in cosmology. And thank you. Thank you very much. Question, please. So other problems appear to want to have across the intersection of four lines of your fluid. Can you pass through this uh, singularity with other problems in these approximations? Uh, can we pass without the problem? Well, okay. So you mean the shell crossing? So, so yes. this is this is uh, this is like a generic feature of all of the models which have no pressure. So the way we okay we are at the very early stage of looking at these things and there are, there are very complicated uh, theories regarding the classification of the singularities occurring at the shirt crossing the way we circumvent it for now is we either uh, change the scale of the smoothing to avoid it until the relevant times or we just assume that once the, sh once the shell crossing occurs basically we we consider it as a structure which will develop so this is like an extrapolation idea and we are no longer interested in the uh intrinsic features of it because in a physically realistic situation probably the pressure would uh prohibit the singularity and but, but okay yeah go ahead just a couple of questions so one is a technical one so you said that there is no uh an averaging technique for tensors. So uh, I, I thought that uh, some other people provided some approach, but is it just too cumbersome to work with? Uh, it, uh, yes, there was a promising uh, direction. I don't, I don't want to be imprecise, but as, as I recall, there was a 
one requirement one requirement which spoiled the, the whole situation that you, you needed a prefixed geometrical structure to perform it. and that made it um, not only cumbersome but also a little bit model dependent in in, in, uh, in the way you, you you try to evaluate this okay. and the, my second question uh, could you go to the plot where you try to find this uh, uh, surface of uh, average uh, dimension expansion with these dots uh, where you write them yes uh, so uh, this is uh, so what do we see here is it's just uh, some i know uh, volume at some Yes, it's like uh, it's the size of a cluster from cut off from the n body simulation. Okay. And the red points are the ones with the radial velocity equals zero. Okay. okay. And uh, this circle is supposed to demark this uh, vanishing average of expansion or? Uh, surface of an expansion equals zero, it's like a weighted uh, fit. Uh, because this. Uh, prediction was made for a spherical symmetry. Okay. So obviously, uh, it's like it's like a forced fit. To... Yes. Uh, so since you were talking about averages, uh, so I, I, I wonder if, you, if there is a reason to use such a certain example of the average of stock expansion in zero, or if there's a statistical statement. It's not like something like a track surface where we know that. There is a surface where we can, you know, especially for remote coupling, five years being zero. But now we're talking about averages. So, could there be that uh, there is distribution of expansions and there's like a, a tail of these expansions which can still make it go, uh, up, how to say, away further than it this surface? Uh, um. You no, not uh, really, but but yes, because uh, well, here we're trying to average things, so these are not uh, statements about the exact uh, properties of geometry, but it's a statistical nature. There could be like moments where it was previous because it's uh, well, not uh, I wouldn't agree fully because, um. That is related to the actual volume. Oh. Okay. But it's okay, but it's uh, the main dependence. Yes, sure. But uh, it's not purely a statistical feature. When we think of an average expansion, it's a weight basically pinpoint where, 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 where this should be located. Okay. Yeah. Not questions, comments, remarks. If not, let us thank the speaker as well.